Um, such a pleasure and honor to have with us Abdul um, Kakta from Augusta here with us today for the next talk. Abdul, I'm dying to hear about your living histories. Please tell us, take it away. Thanks, Sri, for inviting me. Um, my name is Abdul Malmikakara. I'm an assistant professor of physics at Augusta University, Georgia. I'll start with a history about myself, where I'm from. I'm originally, uh, my family and myself, we are from a group of islands called Lakshadweep Islands. It's uh, out in the Arabian Sea. Um, and I guess our more famous neighbors, uh, Maldives is our more famous neighbor. But it's the same chain of islands, um, part of which belongs to India, called Lakshadweep Islands. That's where I'm originally from. So just to give you a bit of a background of uh, how the islands look like, they're about um, a group of 36 islands uh, that form uh, this uh, chain of islands. And they're located about 150 to 200 miles away from the mainland uh, India. And this is how the islands look like. It's kind of, it rises sharply from the ocean floor. Um, there is a lagoon associated with the island, but the islands, island itself is usually like a thin sliver of land, a couple of miles long and a few miles wide. And each of these islands roughly has about 10 to 15,000 people living in it. And the, the beaches are truly magnificent over there. If uh, people if people have usually heard about Maldives, so it's very similar to that. But given given that it's a remote location, um, access to education and healthcare and so on is very challenging, as you can imagine, being a remote area. So a lot of people from Lakshadweep they tend to move to the to the mainland part of India, particularly Kerala, which is a state uh, closest to it. So um, I grew up. In Lakshadweep, then uh, got a, a lot of my primary education and so on in Kerala. And then another big event in my life was when my parents, they decided to move to West Africa. My my dad is a dentist by profession and he wanted to um, work in an underserved country. To uh, So the religious community that I belong to, uh, they, uh, they built hospitals and schools um, in many countries in West Africa. So he decided, my dad decided to dedicate his life and go work there. So I, I uh, hence I moved with my family to the Gambia, which is where I spent my high school years. I completed my high school education and so on there. So Gambia, is, uh, it's a very interesting country in the sense that um, it's surrounded on all three sides by Senegal and it's so it's essentially uh, and then on on one side by Atlantic Ocean and um, there's a river that flows throughout the length of the country um, towards the Atlantic Ocean and uh, Gambia is like around uh, it's a country that's surround or it's on both sides of uh, river Gambia so the high school that I went to it's um, near a town called Sarakunda. And this is a picture of my high school uh, called Nusrat High School. This is the uh, assembly grounds where students would meet together and uh, we would have our uh, kind of meetings of, of the school and so on. And you can see some, um, some of the school buildings uh, on the sides there. So that, that was my early history and um, how, I interest, how I got interested in pursuing science was uh, when I was around 11 or 12 years old, my dad uh, gave me a book uh, regarding Professor Abdul Salam. He is a Nobel uh, Laureate in Physics, 1979 Nobel Laureate. Um, he, he comes from the um, same religious community as me and similar cultural background. So I was really inspired by his work. He got a Nobel Prize uh, for unifying the weak, weak force with the electromagnetic force. Uh, so with together with uh, Weinberg and Glashow. So his uh, scientific work was of course uh, very inspiring in terms of unif unifying fundamental forces in nature. And uh, more recently, um, the Imperial College in London, which is where he spent most of his time, 
they renamed the library there, the, the central library after him. And this came as a result of uh, um, the uh, Imperial College conducting a study and figuring out who are some of the scientific figures who were who were under recognized. So uh, that uh, this was primarily motivating um, their uh, renaming of the library. And then in terms of uh, impact, uh, Professor Salam, um, another aspect of his life was that uh, not only uh, did he achieve scientific success, but he used the money that he won from the Nobel Prize to establish um, the International Center for Theoretical Physics. And the contribution of ICTP, as it's called, uh, has been amazing, especially for scientists from developing countries from the global south, as you can call it. Um, it, it hosts visitors from um, many countries in Africa, as well as uh, South America, or the global south under underdeveloped countries, and really provides a mean, uh, provides a support system for them to continue in the sciences so that um, uh, truly, um, as, as Professor Salam remarked, said that scientific thought is a common heritage and uh, common and shared heritage of mankind. So I, 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 I was really inspired by his um, activism to unify mankind on one hand through, through uh, building this institute. And, um, and currently the institute ICTP is celebrating its uh, 60th year. So uh, that that uh, led me to go into physics, and uh, I uh, after my um, after leaving Gambia, I came to the U.S., did my undergraduate degree in physics, and then I started my I completed my Ph.D. at uh, the, at University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. I was um, I had a really good mentor there, Oriol Walls, um, and during those days in my Ph.D., I worked on pure theoretical condensed matter physics. We thought about problems in superfluidity, super uh, solidity, and, and superconductivity, and so on. Um, really low temperature physics, and then and during that time, I was also fortunate to interact with uh, Professor Chandan Das Gupta. He was at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, we worked uh, closely, and I had the opportunity to visit uh, IISC campus in Bangalore a few times. And the type of work that we did in spin models, uh, it also really motivated me to look into biology and problems in biophysics that, that I could, um, that I, I wanted to then switch from, when I, when I completed my PhD, I wanted to switch from pure condensed matter physics to biological physics or biophysics. So I was uh, fortunate then after my PhD to work with Dave Thirumalai I believe he has also presented in this series before. He, he was a really um, great uh, time that I spent in, uh, as a postdoc in his group. Uh, I had a lot of independence to work on the questions that, that really interested me. And um, it had a, there was a really great environment in his uh, lab at UT Austin. So while there, um, working on um, computational, primarily computational problems, uh, I had the I was fortunate to come across uh, John Wallingford. He's a developmental biologist. He used to be across the building, a uh, building across from us uh, on 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 the Austin campus. There, he works on Cenopus primarily, and um, it was um, uh, great for me to interact with his group. And he really became a mentor for me in terms of doing work and looking at cell dynamics in vivo. In, in developing organisms. Uh, so that, that I was really fortunate to work with uh, both of them there. So currently, um, I, I really like this cartoon that's shown here. Someone, a pitcher is throwing a ball that I, I took from, um, this is the credit for the picture, and then the ball transforms uh, into cells. So um, if, you, if you think about basic laws of physics, um, for example, when the, the trajectory of the ball based on uh, kinematics equations, one can predict the trajectory, how the ball travels in space and time. But then biological systems are much more complex and um, we still are yet to fully understand what are the basic principles or, or the basic laws that underlie cell migration, for instance, or cell differentiation. So in my research group, 
Um, and we think about questions such as how do physical factors like cell stiffness, uh, adhesion between cells, and uh, so on. How does that? How does? How do these physical uh, properties impact their ability to move? And also, uh, we uh, we are working on understanding um, what are the different uh, phases. Are there parallels to phases of matter? Like we know that they're solid, liquid, and so on. Phases of matter. Are there similar uh, properties to cell collectives? So these are kind of the basic questions that we think about in in our group, and we use computational techniques to better understand these sort of uh, collective cell behaviors. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Abdul, for a wonderfully fascinating and inspiring talk. Uh, audience, please send your questions to me via chat. Let me get started by asking you, you were um, in the midst of so many different academic traditions. Um, and I feel like I must ask you to tell us about the surprising similarities and the surprising differences between academic institutions in these different cultures. Yeah, so yeah, growing up in India, Africa, and then the US, mm -hmm. but uh, that that's something um, like the quote that I shared that science is a common heritage of mankind. So that's something that's common Newton's laws or whatever basic principles that we study, it's the same. Um, principles that no matter where we go. So that's a common underlying theme. But overall, also, I, I think mm -hmm. there there is uh, appreciation for knowledge and uh, value for knowledge. There is, uh, that's something, some other, another aspect that's common among the different places that I've been. Um, question from chat. Abdul, have you visited the ICTP or sent your students to participate in their programs? Yeah, that's a really good question. I that's one of my on my to do list to be able to visit ICTP, uh, but I have never been yet, or neither send my students uh, yet. But I hope to do so sometime soon. Um, and final question, which is that you're now in Augusta, um, and. And and I want you to specifically tell us about mentoring students in the context of Augusta compared to, let's say, being in an R1 university or where people tend to imagine the biophysics um, workforce comes from. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Augusta University is an R2 institution so there is a good emphasis on teaching and research. So my appointment is half half teaching and half research. So part of that student mentorship and student success is an important um, part of my work responsibility. So, but I've been fortunate to have really uh, smart students um, that I have gotten to work with here. Uh, and uh, I feel like that's one of the things that that I really enjoy about my profession, um, I guess irrespective of biophysics or any particular field, but uh, overall I enjoy interacting with my students, getting to see them um, getting stronger in, in, the, in doing their research as well as um, other soft skills that they, they gain through engaging in research. Thank you so much again, Abdul. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I'm closing the recording